Office here at International House for the Dr. Robert H. Kirshner Memorial Human Rights Lecture. My name is Katie Callow Wright. I'm an Assistant Vice President for Campus Life and Assistant Dean in the College. It's an honor to welcome Margaret Ward and Nelson Ward DeWitt, the alumni, friends, and residents of International House, university faculty, staff, and students, and community members to tonight's program. As you may know, this evening, we are beginning the celebration of the 80th anniversary of International House Chicago. From the day International House opened its doors, our mission has been to promote cross-cultural understanding, mutual respect, and friendship among the students and scholars, and on the part of the people of metropolitan Chicago towards individuals of all nations and backgrounds. Through the iHouse Residence Life Experience and our Global Voices series, including programs like the Kirshner Memorial Lecture, International House Chicago is dedicated to transforming people's lives for a better world. I want to thank Michael Geyer and Susan Gesch and the Human Rights Program for a long-standing and strong relationship with International House. Our partnership serves as an example of our many partnerships across the campus and the city, which are critical in the engaging, interesting, and vibrant community and programs that we have here. I hope to see many of you at International House this weekend and throughout throughout the alumni and reunion events, as well as the over the course of the next year as we celebrate turning 80 as a house. Now it's my pleasure to introduce John Kelly, faculty director and professor of the Department of Anthropology and in the college. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual Robert Kirshner Memorial Lecture. Uh, the human rights program at the University of Chicago is unique in many ways. It's uh, the faculty uh, committee is extraordinarily broad, involving more disciplines and more interests than is common in the field of the study of human rights. But this event, which is the capstone of our year, also suggests something else to you. I'm very pleased to welcome so many of our students, so many faculty, so many alumni, and so many other friends to come and join us tonight to hear a very important lecture, very much on a topic that, that Robert Kirshner would have, would have appreciated. Uh, and to show you that uh, we take this outreach role and this set of connections very seriously, it's very important to us that you care to come and participate with us in intellectual events. We're not talking about parties or other kind. We're talking about serious intellectual work related to human rights that we're all doing together. And we want our program to be relevant, and we really appreciate it that you're here. I want to remember that this is the sixth Robert Kirshner Memorial Lecture, and thank again John Conroy, Juan Mendez, Alexander Heeman, Alex Kotlewitz, and especially Sarah Paretsky, who's here with us tonight, and who gave the first of the Robert Kirshner Memorial Lectures. Not everything we do is driven by our deep uh, commitments and interests in human rights. And I might not have the story straight, but one of the reasons why uh, Sarah Paretsky was, in fact, an extremely appropriate uh, choice for our inaugural Kirshner lecture, as if I understand the story straight, was because she knew Robert Kirshner. And the way she knew Robert Kirshner really had very little to do with human rights. It had something to do with a trumpet and a fact checker. Uh, Apparently, the fact checker of Sarah Paretsky's novel was skeptical that a human being could actually be killed by being hit over the head with a trumpet. And Sarah Paretsky had to prove this to him. So she needed an expert who was an authority. And this sent a letter one way or another to Robert Kirshner, who, as well as being a well-known humanitarian, forensics expert, committed human rights advocate, and someone who we really should remember. Uh, as also one of the founding partners in our own human rights program. He was a music aficionado, so it seemed likely that of all people, he would know whether, in fact, a human being could be killed by being hit over the head with a trumpet. Which, to tell you the truth, I actually don't know whether a human being could be killed. And I don't think that's one of the questions we'll solve tonight. Uh, I have uh, two more tasks. Uh, one of them is to brief you all, taking the advantage of this captive audience on where we are and all we've been doing in the last year in the program to speak very briefly about this. But I think it's of interest to you and it's important to take this occasion to lay down some news for you to, to take home and to think about. It's been a watershed year for our human rights program, especially thanks to the generosity of Anne and Richard Posen, whose grant has made possible a ramping up, a kind of landmark expansion of our activities. 
Our internship program, which is supported very widely by many people in the room, is uh, thriving and is consolidated. Um, we've now begun to make grants to faculty for the development of new human rights courses. We added eight courses in eight different departments, six of which had never before given a human rights course to the curriculum of the college of the University of Chicago in the last year. We also supported not only a, a conference last year, but a, a consolidating conference, a return of the authors to campus, in fact, who met in this building, the other side of the building, uh, to work to get, to pull together the papers on corporate social responsibility, which will lead to the first volume in a series we now intend of publications to help push forward the scholarship on human rights. That was uh, edited by Charlotte Walker, and will be edited by Charlotte Walker, who is our wrapping up a very successful internship here in our program. And uh, we've also begun grants to faculty for symposiums and conferences to support scholarly work on new organized uh, topical programs, projects that push the human rights literature in specific ways. In fact, we've launched four such programs. One on overcoming the crisis in humanitarianism. One on rights and duties, the relationship of rights and duties, which is more complex than first appears when we do historical and cultural work. One on human rights at home uh, and problems in the United States related to international standards. And finally, one on health and human rights and the global challenges of health care and what rights have to do with it. We've put in successful uh, uh, applications for support from the, from the university for, uh, for workshop uh, sponsoring and we're also going to sponsor events ourselves. And we want these programs to pull the human rights literature forward. Uh, my final uh, topic is, is to give some thanks. I'll be turning the podium over to my colleagues on the executive board to, uh, for, to uh, announce some well-earned recognitions and honors as an end point of our, of our year in the program. But I want to thank, uh, first of all, Barbara Kirshner and her three sons, Denny, Benji, and Josh, who are all here with us tonight for their support for this wonderful lecture. Uh, it's a very generous <laughs> act. I'd like to thank all the faculty on the Human Rights Board, many of whom I can see are among us here tonight for their service on the committees that have, uh, that have enabled us to establish and develop all of these programs and awards and pull human rights deeper and more broadly into the uh, intellectual activities of the University of Chicago. And finally, I'd like to thank Sarah Moberg, who is our Office and Events Manager, uh, for her amazing logistical work all year and especially uh, her work arranging everything and everyone for this event. So thank Sarah, thank you very much. Now I'll turn it over to Renslow Scherer. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm Renslow Scherer. I'm a professor of medicine in the section of infectious disease, and I'm the new, one of the new co-chairs for the Faculty Advisory Committee of the Human Rights Program. So I'm uh, probably the youngest member of the group. Um, not so young, though. And I, it's my privilege to talk about our fabulous students uh, who really have uh, deserved the recognition they get here at the culmination of the year. Um, three quick points. The first is the Ignacio Martin Barro Human Rights Essay Prizes of 2012. This is our 10th year giving these awards. This was named uh, after Martin Barro, who was one of the Jesuits who was murdered, uh, murdered in El Salvador in 1989. And at uh, Central American University, he developed a field of psychology about the psychological consequences of living under an oppressive uh, regime that still stands uh, today. So if these undergrads are uh, in the audience, please stand and we'll recognize the whole group at the end. First, uh, an, as uh, undergrads, Vanessa Burnick in Near East Languages and Civilizations on uh, the Anfal Campaign, A Politically Feasible Atrocity. And Michael Kenstowitz in Laws, Letters, and Society, writing on Establishing Expectations for the Genocide Convention's Use, Politics as Usual. In the MA professional category, Erin Bradley from the School of Social Service Administration. She wrote on what happened to the woman with the AK-47, the transformation of women's rights in post-revolutionary Nicaragua. <laughs> uh, 
And among PhD candidates, Jeffrey Kahn in anthropology, who wrote on border laboratories, lawfare, and the rights of Haitian asylum seekers in the United States. He's out of town. Uh, the second category is the Dr. Isaac Wolf Human Rights Post Baccalaureate Fellowship for this year. This was established by a surgeon from Miami, Florida, who's also a UC alumnus. It's a year long fellowship awarded to a graduating college student who has demonstrated excellence uh, in pursuit of human rights as a minor. And I'm uh, pleased to say this year's award winner is Lucy Little in music uh, for work at the Heartland Alliance Youth and Residential Services here in Chicago. Also in this category, uh, unusually, there's a special award for Samuel Arthur Devonport in classical studies for his work in Burmese labor radio in Thailand. And then finally, uh, we, are, we have two beautiful displays that I encourage you all to see in the back of the room as part of our Seeing Human Rights Photography Prizes. This was a, a grant from the Frank Institute for the Humanities, and there are two awardees. Uh, Colleen Denny from the Pritzker School of Medicine has a, a wonderful display of Albinism Awareness Day at the Kamuzu Skin Clinic in Lalongwe, Malawi. Is she in the audience? No, and the second is Hassan Reza, who's a PhD in SSA, uh, with also support of the Young Power and Social Action of Chittagong, Bangladesh, writing about the human cost of shipbreaking industry in Bangladesh. <laughs> and now I'll introduce the final speaker before our speaker, Dan Brody. Hello, I'm Dan Bredney. I'm the other co-chair um, this year for the board. Um, and I just want to recognize very briefly um, the graduate students who are receiving um, support next year um, through the generosity of Anne and Richard Posen, and then also um, those who have been um, summer interns, uh, and finally those in um, our uh, human rights minor. For all of these, while we hope that they will be doing great work while they are either doing their research, serving as interns, or being students here at the college in the human rights minor. Um, part of the point of having this support is to draw them in, get them involved in human rights studies and human rights work, because ultimately we hope that this will help people um, see their way to doing further work once they move on in their lives. So first I want to recognize um, the recipients of the human rights research grants for 2012 and 13. Um, there are um, eight of them, Lauren Coyle from Anthropology, Mark Garati, also Anthropology, Myra Hyatt, Anthropology, Anthropology seems to care about human rights, um, Patrick Kelly, History, Zing Ma, Comparative Human Development and Anthropology, Aaron Moore, Comparative Human Development, Jessica Robinson, Guess Where, Anthropology, and finally, Thomas Swartz from Sociology. Um, uh, so let's give a, a round of applause to all of them. And, right. Uh, um, and now, while I suspect not too many of the um, undergraduates who have received um, internships or minors are here today because this is the end of 10th week of the quarter, uh, and so um, they're doing what we want University of Chicago undergraduates to do, namely stay home on uh, Friday night and study. Um, so, um, but what we have is a, an, an internship program in which students are given $5,000 um, to do a summer's worth of um, human rights work somewhere in the world, and they go everywhere. Um, and there are this um, this past summer there were 22, uh, and we just if you are here in the audience, uh, please do stand. Uh, any of you here? Well, let's give them a round of applause anyway. And finally, we now have and have had for the last several years a minor in human rights in the college. Um, we can't have a major, we're not, uh, uh, we don't make appointments and so forth, but we now have a way in which we can um, 
give undergraduates the opportunity for fairly focused work in human rights. Um, they take five classes, um, and this way they get to know one another and they see where there's a, an undergraduate cohort. And again, this is part of enabling them to build human rights thinking and work into we hope their future lives. And for those, I think we had um, actually 25, which makes um, the minor one of the largest in the college. Uh, any of you about? No, you're studying. Good. Ah, we have one. Why are you here? <laughs> we have two. And now I'm going to turn the podium over to Susan Zesch. Good evening. I have the uh, great pleasure to introduce our speakers for tonight, but before I do that, I want to give a shout out to my classmates from the class of 72 who are here for our 40th reunion. <laughs> I'm not going to name all of you and your names aren't in the program, but you know who you are. Um, one of the things that we reflect actually after 40 years of, from getting out of the college is that the human rights program funds and supports students to do things that we would have had to drop out in order to do. And it shows a change in how the college relates to the world while keeping its intellectual rigor. It really cares about connecting students with what is happening out there in the land of reality, we think. Um, I also want to thank my leadership team this year, John Kelly, uh, Dan Bredney, Renzo Scherer. We've had a really amazing year um, herding cats, figuring out how to uh, begin to implement this wonderful donation we've gotten from Ann and Richard Posen, which is going to help our program grow in a lot of ways. So thanks to the leadership team who you've just heard from. Um, in order to introduce our uh, speakers, having read uh, Margaret Ward's book, which is fabulous, and we have copies of it for sale for cash or checks out at the table in the lobby, and she will be signing books after the program. And if you didn't bring cash, there's an ATM machine in the hall. Um, <laughs> I, want, I decided to look through, in all of the human rights instruments which have been written and signed and ratified around the world in the modern human rights era, so since 1948, there's only one mention of love. In the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which entered into force in 1990, in which every nation in the world has ratified, except the United States, the preamble says, the state's parties recognize that the child, for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality, should grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. I'm going to let Margaret and Nelson tell their amazing story, but I wanted to highly recommend to you that this is a quite remarkable book. In fact, it seemed to me as I read it over in the past weekend that it's three books, or three stories at least. It's, an, it's a story about an international adoption and the later connection through our late beloved Bob Kirshner with Nelson's original family. It's a war story. It's an inside look through Margaret's recreation of the experiences of Nelson's biological parents who were active guerrillas under arms in the war in El Salvador in the 1980s. And finally, it's a story about children and the terrible things that happen to them in war when the fabric of family and society that should protect them is torn apart. And it's also a story about the brave and generous acts of people who help children construct and reconstruct many different forms of families to give them an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding that they are guaranteed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We're very proud to present this program tonight, not only because it's a great story, but because we're also proud of the University of Chicago's connections to this story particularly Robert Kirshner's work with Pro Buscada. Bob spent a lot of his time dealing with death, dealing with developing stand scientific standards for determining whether people are tortured. And he did, worked on very dark topics, but those of us who knew him knew that he also had a tremendous amount of love in his heart. He loved music, he loved art, he loved his family, he loved food. And I think that the work with Pro Buscada, which was working with children and providing what were hopefully happy resolutions of puzzles and stories, is something that helped him balance the darkness of the rest of the work that he was engaged in through his career. 
The work of ProBusca though was supported by the human rights program during Bob's life and I remember when I came into the program 11 years ago there was a student named Ana Ayala who was working for Bob as the staff person of ProBusca though we were paying her a salary. And I looked her up on the internet today, I haven't talked to her in a couple of years, but she is now a lawyer in Washington DC with an LLM in human rights from Georgetown Law School and she's working on a project on health and human rights and I think Bob would be very proud of her and I remember her saying that working with Bob really helped frame her ideas of what she was going to do after college and it shows in what she's doing today. We also had a wonderful connection with Father John Cortina, who worked with Bob as a partner in the development of this really amazing transnational um, cooperative project to trace children adopted out of El Salvador during the war. So I'm not, John Cortina was here several times. I gave Margaret today a picture, a copy of a picture from the Hyde Park Herald of John Cortina and Bob Kirshner um, speaking at a seminar we had here. And I really don't want to spend any more time telling the rest of the story, but I wanted the audience to know that yesterday marks 29 years since Margaret and her husband Tom met Nelson as a baby in El Salvador and yesterday is also the 27th birthday of Nelson's younger brother Derek. So we're very happy to welcome Nelson Ward-Dewitt and Margaret Ward and Tom Younger who's the producer of Nelson's film to share their stories with us today. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, this is going to be a little bit unconventional as lectures go, since um, you're going to hear many voices and we have different ways of talking about the story. Um, I'm going to begin with just a little uh, word of thanks and a few thoughts and then turn things over to um, the producer director of the film, John Younger, who has been able to. Oh, yes. You see, my tech person's telling me I'm already forgetting what I was supposed to do. Okay, there we go. Um, Susan, that, you know, mentioning the word love, that was perfect because y you may have sort of seen this title that. Nelson helped me develop as we were asked to have a title for what we were going to do today many, many months ago. And he said, Mom, you know, you think about human rights and it, sometimes it's pretty depressing. You know, you're, what are the words you then associate immediately? It might be human rights abuses or human rights violations maybe even a word like atrocity. Maybe you would think inter-American court of human rights, but you don't normally think of love. You don't normally come up with the first word being joy. And Nelson said, our story does have, of course, many sorrowful and dark things in it, but there's also a lot of joy and love. And we wanted to have joy be the first word. So we're going to talk about joys and challenges of reconnecting in a situation which is full of violence, but also of love. Um, I think that most of the joys I've felt in the process of both experiencing our story and writing about it as an author and as a mother have been mixed. You know, there was sort of never any truly unmitigated joy. Joys were often combined with some anxiety and worries. But today is an unmitigated joy. And, and for that, I want to thank the Human Rights Program. Um, and I want to thank the Kirshner family um, because it's just a joy to be able to be here, a privilege to speak with an audience where I know you care deeply, your interest and your sympathy for the subject is wholehearted. So I want to begin with those words of thanks and I'll return to some of my thoughts about joys and 
challenges at a later point. I want to introduce um, a third speaker who will be very brief but is an important linchpin for this presentation. And I think I'm supposed to do this. Is that right? Yes. Again, when Nelson and I got closer to this time and we're talking with each other, I think at length on Skype, I was in Florida and he was uh, either in Panama or in Boston, and trying to think about how we would shape this. Um, he shared with me some of the rough cut of the documentary film that he and John have been working on for over a year. And I was so excited when I saw this. I said, that has to come first, because it will give you what it takes a weekend at least to read the book, the narrative of the family story. And then Nelson and I can reflect on it a little bit with you, and then receive your questions about it. Um, and I think it would be most appropriate for uh, the producer-director of the film, who's joined us for this special privilege and this occasion from Los Angeles, um, to tell you what you're going to see. You're going to see an eight-minute segment, not the whole film. It's not done yet. Um, so John Younger is one of the reconnections in this story. And he'll tell you a little bit about that and introduce the film that we're going to then look at first. And then I'll return to the podium, and we'll continue from there. John is uh, self-describes himself as a TV and film producer. Okay. So John, please. Hello. Um, OK. So I first met Nelson and his family over 20 years ago. Um, I was about to be a freshman in college. And I was a camp counselor at a summer camp in western Massachusetts. And Nelson and I shared a bunk. <laughs> he was eight years old. Um, and I just want to tell you one memory I had from back then that stuck with me all these years. And I, Nelson found these pictures recently. I didn't know they still existed. but. Um, they kind of confirmed my memory, which was, I remembered from his family that on visiting day um, that he and Derek, who's here in the front row, it seemed that every time I saw them, Derek never let go of Nelson's finger. They weren't just holding hands, but he was holding one finger. It seemed like all day long, from morning till night. And uh, that, was, that was the way I remembered them. And I, I remembered it because I felt like I have two brothers myself, and there were other campers with brothers that were always fighting and, and stuff like that. And, and I just felt like sometimes when it's not the package that you're used to seeing, that sometimes that the um, people that don't have something tied up in a neat box like you and I, they have the most to show you about a topic. Um, so that's that's what I felt like at the time. And. Nelson and I reconnected on Facebook four years ago, and he was call calling himself Nelson Roberto, and I had to figure out why. That was fascinating to me, and um, so we've been sharing th that story together for a few years now, and, um, and that also is not a, a, a package of a, a family and an identity that maybe people are, are used to seeing, but I think it really has a lot to show us about what, what some of these topics mean. So this is eight and a half minutes, the opening of the film. Um, that we'll be working on and completing this summer. And it's based on a trip we took to El Salvador about a year ago when we traveled there to um, attend the Day of the Disappeared Children. I have just a, a few visuals, but most of what I do is with words. <laughs> um, the books that are for sale this evening are what I call the plain vanilla which is, are the hardback edition that did not have the, this particular cover. And I wanted, this is the paperback, which they sold out. And uh, they are now being printed on demand. You can get them, but it's a little, little tricky. Takes a little bit longer. And um, I wanted to say a word about the cover. Um, the title, Missing Mila Finding Family, um, 
is illustrated in a way by the, the two photographs that are in the book. And so if you do buy the hardcover, you will find these photographs in, in the book in black and white. Mila Ana Milagro was Nelson's birth mother's name. But the family called her Mila. And Milagro, meaning miracle, is something that we think about and that I play with that word a little bit in the, in the course of the book, or the three books. <laughs> The word missing, she's the voice who's missing, the person who was killed, the person who disappeared. Of course, Nelson disappeared to his family also for a long period of time. But we didn't think of him as a disappeared child. We didn't know his background. But as it unfolds, uh, I realize the extent to which in his heart, and perhaps without talking much about it, the figure that Nelson focused on as he was growing up and wondering who he was and what his real story was, since there was no birth record. And when we adopted him in Honduras, we had no idea he was Salvadoran. So you know, he, we knew virtually nothing to tell him. But the thing that he had focused on was, well, you know you have a mother. You know you have a biological mother. And that was the person he always wanted to see, to know. And at the very moment that you have this joy of being reunited with your family, he realizes that, of course, he will never see his mother. So that's one of those joys that, that's mitigated. It's not a pure joy. So she's missed, and she's missing. So that's sort of the, the meaning of that part of the title. And the other part of the title, Finding Family, is sort of illustrated by the, the photograph on the right, which is the the moment when we brought Nelson home to Wellesley, Massachusetts at that time, um, and we're standing on our front porch. This is my husband, Tom, who's the only member of our immediate family who's not here today. And uh, Nelson in my arms. And I use the photographs in the, in the book. But the idea of finding family is, of course, in a sense, after being in an orphanage for a year, Nelson did find family. We are his family. But then, of course, he also finds his birth family. And in his birth family, we find more family. And the person I think most responsible for the trajectory which has made us be one family was Mama Chila. She's, she's the heroine of our story with her persistence, for her this one grandchild of many, many grandchildren she believed was still alive, although her daughter had been killed. And she was determined, once the Civil War was over and people felt safe enough to hunt, to find him. And luckily, then there were organizations, human rights organizations, that helped in that search, in particular Pro Buscada. Uh, when she finally was handed on to them, she, she got the kind of help that she needed to be able to put the the facts such as they were together and have him be found. I mean, that was a long process of about five years until we were contacted by Robert Kirshner. Um, so finding family is also not just one level, but sort of many levels in the story. Um, I want to speak about a, a few things and uh, promised that I would keep it fairly short. But I do have a few illustrations. You may already be a little bit mystified from the segment of the film. So many different countries get mentioned. And no matter how well-informed and intelligent my audience is, I recognize that, that North Americans in particular are geographically challenged. And so I like to always bring a map of Central America just to remind us of the countries and to point out the ones that are in our story. Um, Tegucigalpa, Honduras is where Nelson was orphaned after a shootout and was in an orphanage for a year. And that's the place where we went to adopt him under somewhat murky and interesting circumstances, which I outline in great detail in the first chapter of my book. But they're not really my purpose here today. And then we have had mentioned already Costa Rica, where Mama Chila took from El Salvador Nelson's 
older sister and brother and raised them. There were also other relatives living in Costa Rica. And that is where we had our reunion in December 1997. So that when he says the airport and suddenly you're Costa Rica, you know, well, what does this have to do with El Salvador? So, but he was born in El Salvador. And because his mother was a revolutionary and was on a mission in Honduras, she had her, younger ch her youngest child, who was a baby at the time, with her in Honduras. So you have those three countries already involved. But Nicaragua also plays a role because the group that his birth parents were part of, the FPL, during uh, the period in the early 1980s and when the Sandinistas had come to power after 79, gave protection to the leadership members of this Salvadoran revolutionary group near Managua. And so Nelson always says, oh yes, I was, in, <laughs> I was conceived in Nicaragua. So that country counts too. Then of course we have El Salvador and that's the tiny one of course. And I, and I like when I, when I talk just a little bit about this geography to remind us of how small a country it is. Since we come from Massachusetts, we think about the size of Massachusetts, but heavily populated. And um, if you're thinking about the time period in which the forced disappearances were occurring in particular and many of the, the human rights abuses there the, the, and violations and horrible massacres, particularly the er early 80s. Some of the statistics that uh, one can find suggest that in the year 1980, um, in a, th a thousand civilian deaths were occurring every month in El Salvador. And if you think about the proportion of the total population, that would be comparable to 50,000 in the United States, civilian deaths per month. Um, and that's even before the, the Civil War proper gets, gets started. So it's just you know, kind of keeping in mind it's a very small country. And um, I think that's enough geography, except for the fact that because of the Civil War, Nelson's birth family is very scattered. And so his birth father, who is alive, lives now in Panama. And he has relatives, of course, the ones you saw, cousins and aunts uh, and uncles in El Salvador. His sister still lives in Costa Rica. His brother and his half-sister live in Panama. He has cousins who live in North America, in Boston, in Seattle, in New Jersey, and, and so forth, people who came during those years to the United States. Um, OK. Uh, Guatemala does not play a big role in our story, but it's a country we shouldn't forget. And I wonder whether some of the people in the audience caught the radio program that aired on This American Life, uh, which is produced here in Chicago with Ira Glass over this Memorial Day weekend that was on a story of reunion of a young man who 30 years ago was one of two little boys who were taken by the, the military people who massacred the entire village and yet has now been reunited with his father who was not in the village the day of the massacre whereas his mother and his eight brothers and sisters were all murdered on that day. And it's, it's, it's a tremendous story. If you can get a hold of it, um, it's available as a podcast now, because it was last week's uh, This American Life. It's a whole hour radio broadcast. And in the airport at Boston yesterday, I, I bought the newspaper because there's the photograph of him, the, the father and the son meeting in the airport. They've now brought the, the father. He's in the United States, the young man, illegally, but he's here. And uh, we'll get some help now to, uh, it's, it's a very important human rights story because of finding this young man and the, with the DNA testing, they were able to have a successful prosecution of some of the people who perpetrated the crimes. Okay, that takes us a little bit uh, far afield, but not too far afield. Okay, I just wanted to show the originals of these two photographs. 
This is Nelson's mother, Anna Malagro, at about age 16. By then, she was already involved in the revolution. By age 25, she'd had three children, and she was killed. She was very young. That's one thing I try to keep in mind. And this is the other photograph of, of us bringing him home. While I was in Florida this winter, I had a, an opportunity to go to the Holocaust Museum of Southwest Florida. They have a small educational center there. And they had a, an exhibit uh, of a photographer from Minnesota. Um, it was just there for a short period of time. It was very moving to me. It, it was a tribute to Argentina's disappeared. And um, this young woman photographer had, had gotten quite close to some of the older mothers and grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, who I think are probably well known to you. In fact, I think even the issue of disappeared with Argentina is, is better known to, to audiences that I've spoken to than anything about El Salvador. And there was one photograph there and story of a woman named Sarah Russ. And it moved me. I, I spent 40 years as a professor of German language and literature. And this woman survived the Nazi death camps, went in around 1948 to Argentina with her husband only to have their only son be one of the disappeared in Argentina. And there was a quotation with the photograph that, again, it just really moved me. And I want to read you this quotation. It is not possible to undo history, but to investigate, to ask, to question, and to remember will without doubt have to be your path. I thought, how interesting that she says, your path. I'm interested in language, so she doesn't say my path. She doesn't use that possessive adjective. She says, your path. She also doesn't say our path, you know, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. She says, your path. And in a sense, that means, you know, all of us. It's sort of a little bit of a challenge. And the things that we need to do are to investigate as someone like Robert Kirshner did, and without his commitment to that sort of investigation, um, we wouldn't be here today. But remembering, and we've seen the memorial wall, um, is questioning, asking. Those, those, are, those are active verbs that you know, sort of challenge us. We can't all be forensic scientists. And I think for me, you know, this was sort of an act of sharing, of using, I hope, my literary skills to, to write about our story. And what I found was a great joy in doing that. You know, one of those mixed joys. Because it also brought Nelson a lot closer to me as a young adult. Because as I was writing this project, he started writing, you know, getting in the act. And his writings I could incorporate into the, into the book. His sister, Ava, started writing and expressing her feelings about her past and about the way in which we were a family. And, and those two I could incorporate into the, into the work so that while I'm the narrative structure, there are many voices in the book. The letters from the aunts, the, the words of, of Mama Chila, the words of the children. And as I was working on it, it, it began to have a trajectory that was somewhat unexpected, that was challenging for me. I really needed to get into the history to find out a lot more about if I was going to understand his birth parents, if I was going to understand his birth mother, which was important to him and to me, 
then I needed to delve much more deeply into this whole history. And my background, um, I didn't really know Spanish, so I really tried to learn some Spanish and so I could communicate with members of the family and interview them. And as we got to know each other better, it, it was easier for them to talk about their experiences and for me to incorporate that as well. Um, so the path wasn't necessarily mapped out, but the book, that's why it's three books, it took a trajectory of its own. It began as, all right, for the family, I should put as many of these pieces together as I can so we have some sort of record so that the other children coming up and the, the more distant cousins will understand why we are one family. I mean, how did this, how did this guy, kind of, you know, this uncle who appears from North America, how does he fit into our family? So I started writing for the family, but then it took on this other aspect. And that's why the last chapter is on the disappeared children of El Salvador. And I can tell my time is almost up, but I'm going to read a very short passage from that last chapter, because I think it's, it's important. This is chapter six, the last chapter, The Disappeared Children of El Salvador. One of the ways, this is not the beginning of the chapter, one of the ways that the armed forces instilled fear in the rural population was to disappear people in the midst of firefights. As one Probusqueda report states, forced disappearance was part of a military strategy. The plan was to disperse and destroy populations that were considered the social base of the guerrilla movement. Children were targeted. Sometimes infants and toddlers were literally ripped from their mother's arms and hoisted into a truck or into the helicopters that swooped down on rural villages and terrorized the populace. populace. And of course, the United States supplied these helicopters. On March 29th, 2007, the first Salvadoran National Day of Remembrance for Disappeared Children was declared. And I think that's important, 2007, that's fairly recent. It was only because of the court case of the Cruz children who had disappeared and still have not been found among the 800 or so cases that Probosqueda has, has searched. And there have been about 222, I believe, reunions. And some children have been found. Uh, and there have been no re reunions. But um, this day of the disappeared was one of the results of a court case that the government had to set aside a day that acknowledged that this had taken place. And that only happened fairly recently. And so this day is, um, the first day was in 2007, and Nelson and John attended the one in 2011, which had its own protect particular aspect because of the president now, Funes, who is from the FMLN party and really welcomed um, the opportunity to apologize on the behalf of the government for what had been done to children. On March 29, 2007, the first Salvador National Day of Remembrance for Disappeared Children was declared. At a ceremony marking the occasion, the gathered families cried out in their desire for reunion and reiterated their demand for a peace with justice. The search will continue until the last disappeared boy or girl has been found. The relatives will not consider themselves defeated. Their hope remains alive. Their struggle persists each day more than the last. By contrast, when General Adolfo Blandon, Chief of Staff of the Salvadoran Armed Forces from 1983 to 1988, was interviewed about the search for disappeared children, he replied, is it worth it to reopen wounds when we have been able to throw some forgetting on them? Unquote. I have been advised to take a similar attitude, to move on quickly to our happy ending and not subject readers to yet more details of this bygone conflict. I've also been warned not to appropriate the heart-wrenching testimonies of other children or other adoptive families for this chapter. I understand these objections, but I must align myself 
with Derek's assertion at the beginning of this chapter, there's an interlude with a poem that he wrote. And in it, it says, it is necessary to tell their story as well. I believe that if one only heaps forgetting on such terrible wounds, they will continue to fester, not heal. At first, Tom and I refused to identify with these other families we were reading about. While we eagerly tried to grasp all the details of our son's intricate story, we hesitated to consider it as part of this larger phenomenon. We tried to keep the word disappeared at arm's length. And I think that's what I, the, the thing that is important for me, this was a trajectory, this was a journey, this was, I didn't immediately grasp that we were part of this, I didn't want to be part of this more sorrowful and difficult, challenging story, but it was very clear that that is something that we have to think about and ask questions about and, and try to share. I'm going to end with one other quote. Uh, this one came to me very recently in a book I was reading, but it was translated from the German by a friend of mine who's a graduate of the University of Chicago and saw that we were speaking. He said, oh, I wish I could be there for alumni reunion. It's a biography of um, a German woman feminist theologian who taught for a good number of years at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Her name was Dorothee Zöhler. She was something of a rebel. She was very active in the 1980s with the sanctuary movement that, that helped bring refugees from uh, areas of conflict like El Salvador and uh, Guatemala into this country where they were sometimes given refuge in churches and then even moved on up to Canada. And there's a sentence in the book, and it just hit me that it fits exactly with my thoughts about, about this and I think also about Robert Kirshner, even though I never met him. My husband spoke with him on the phone, but we never met him in person. We often read about him then in the paper with other things he was doing that were mentioned. But this sentence talks about the, the word compassion. This compasio, a little bit like compañera. It has that uh, com, the with. What does it really mean, compasio? It's the capacity to suffer with another. And the quote from the book is, progress in the struggle for justice is necessarily associated with victims whose suffering one has not only to mourn, but to share. And I think of that word share that Nelson used when he's talking at that first part of the film about his compulsion to share his story. Um, so I think, obviously, someone like Robert Kirshner had a tremendous amount of compassion, I am sure, that he walked with those. Uh, and understood this, this link between love and justice and finding, finding that com way of not just mourning, but sharing, sharing the path in some way with whatever one, one's facility is. So I hope that um, you will also find such ways, okay, of, of uh, cultivating that capacity for compassion, as Dr. Kirshner clearly did. And I'm going to turn the podium now to Nelson, who will tell you a little bit about his sense of joy and challenge. You've already heard him in the film. And then we'll answer a few questions. Thank you very much. So um, I kind of have to admit that as I was getting ready to talk to all of you today, I kind of didn't know what to talk about which is a little strange for me. I usually try and find ways to adapt our story and my experiences to fit the, the subject matter. And you know, as I've been reflecting on why I was having such difficulty, I was thinking maybe it has to do with 
the sort of topic of human rights. And what's interesting, one, one of the many quirks of, of this story and sort of being at the center of it is, is in many ways you don't feel necessarily like a victim in some ways. I mean, I grew up in, a, you know, as I said, a very loving household. And uh, you know, me and my brother, we went to baseball games and had a pretty normal upbringing. So to all of a sudden be told that you are a victim of something is, is a little weird. And uh, that is something that I think um, was also reflected in the, in the, uh, the piece that my mother referred to, the, um, what was it? The, the Guatemala story, yes. Yeah, Oscar. Uh, His name is Oscar, Oscar Ramirez. Alfredo has the same name. Yeah. And I, you know, he, he talked about how you know, his, his father was a, one of the people who committed these atrocities. And he always viewed him as this hero figure. And so it was very odd. And he always received love from that person. And so it was very odd for him to think of this person as doing these terrible things. And I think that I feel similarly, where I don't necessarily view myself as someone who was, was a victim of, of these things. I was too young to remember it. I really don't have any memory of it other than, you know, of course, meeting my family. And I think in that context, it's a little difficult to talk about what were the human rights of, of me you know, that were violated or, or something to that nature. So you know, I think what I'm trying to say, or, or I get a lot of questions on what is it like to be me? You know, what is it like to be in the middle of this story? And it's a very difficult thing to explain. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, or one of the ideas I was thinking about is, as an adopted child, you know, if I could sum up my experience as an adopted child in one question, it would be, where are the people who look like me? And I think that that question is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't say, it has nothing to do with your adoptive family and whether you, you know, whether you fit in with them or not. Because I grew up in a very loving household, and that wasn't, you know, that for me was great. And, but I think the idea of, of where are the people who look like me, it really gets to that core, that human emotion of, of where do I come from, you know? And not having the answer to that for so many years drives this, this you are compelled to find the answer to that. And so I think when, when I received the answer to this all at once, you know, it took me a long time to process everything that happened. But then it compelled me to share that and to talk about it. Because as I say in the video, it's, it's how I deal with it. You know, how do you deal with something like this? And I think um, much of what I am trying to do with the film and with the website originally is to be the voice of my parents, to be the voice that they never had, to tell their side of the story. You know, and obviously that is uh, that can be challenging, and you have to put yourself really on a limb sometimes. But I think it is it's what I have to do. You know, to share the story. And as I've embarked on this journey, you know, I've met other children in similar circumstances. And you know, going back to this theme of joys and challenges, it, it has been such a joy to meet these people that look like me, that walk like me, that, that have the same quirks and oddities. And that is such a joy to have, have a second chance at, at at getting to know your brother and sister, as well as bringing in your, the brother that you grew up with into that family. And then having your siblings from Central America come to visit you and you going to visit them, and regaining these years that were taken from you. And that is one of the many joys. And at the same time, there are all these other challenges that are associated with it. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is just the manner in which we were separated. And, and the circumstances around that are so overwhelming that it, it takes years and years to, to process. You know, As my 
mother was saying, many of the uh, other children were snatched from their parents' arms. And I have friends who had that happen to them. And so it's not, you know, there's this tremendous joy of meeting your, your family. And at the same time, you are overwhelmed by the difficulty, the, the dark nature of, of which you were separated. And I think that that is a very, you know, it takes a long time to, to deal with a lot of that. And, it's, and you do end up in this weird place of joys and challenges. And I think that that is one of the reasons why, at least I thought, that that title was so appropriate for, for our talk today, is that, you know, it's not just, you know, there are so many wonderful, beautiful moments like this. And there are other moments that are difficult. You know, when, when the family that you're getting to know struggles with many of the things that you grew up with and that you take for granted, that can be challenging. How do you help them through their struggles while maintaining your own life? And where is the balance? You know, when do you stop being Nelson and when do you start being Roberto? And vice versa. So I think one of the things that I have had to deal with in, in recent years, which is the most challenging thing, is how do I spend my time? Where do I split? You know, where, where is that line draw? And can I even draw that line? And so far, the answer is no. And, but obviously, I can't be in all places all the time. So having to choose where I'm going to be. Do I go to my, my birth father's 60th birthday, or do I stay here? You know, do I go, do I spend 4th of July in Panama, or do I spend it here? These are some of the challenges that I face now, 14 years after being reunited. So I think that this experience for me has, has really, it, you know, it has defined me in many ways, and it has made me the person that I am. And I think a lot of that has to do with, with the work of the individuals who did all the research and investigative work that brought us together. And you know, I was trying to think of, well, how do I close out? How do I capture that thought, that idea of, of the work that these people have done for me and for others like me? And you know, this morning, I was lying in bed, and this story popped into my head. And it's a bit of a, I'll say, cliche story. It's one that's been used many times before. Uh, it, I found out it was uh, originally written by Lauren Easley. I think that's right. And it's called uh, the, the, the Star Thrower. Most of you probably have heard it as the, man, uh, the starfish thrower. And I'll put it up here. So an old man was picking up objects on the beach and tossing them out into the sea. A young man approached him and saw that the objects were starfish. Why in the world are you throwing the starfish out into the water? If the starfish are still in the beach when the tide goes out and the sun rises high in the sky, they will die, replied the old man. That's ridiculous. There are thousands of miles of beach and millions of starfish. You can't possibly believe you can't really believe that what you're doing could possibly make a difference. The wise old man picked up another starfish, paused thoughtfully, and remarked as he tossed it into the waves, it makes a difference for that one. Now, like I said, I feel like that story is a bit cliche, but I think the, the point or the message that so many people connect with is that we often feel when we are trying to make change in the world and do things that we are that person throwing starfish into the sea one at a time and that our work goes unnoticed and doesn't really change a thing. And I think that, you know, especially in this world of human rights, it is such a dark and difficult subject matter that you do feel like that. And I guess I'm just here to say that it made a difference to me. Thank you. Okay. 
So we have about 15 minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask questions, you can line up in the microphone right in the middle and uh, ask away. I just say you can direct your question to all three. If you're interested about the future of the film, you can ask John something. If you're interested about the book, I mean, you can ask any of us. Yeah, so, so the question was, have any parents approached us asking if, if they were afraid that their children might leave or, or something to that effect because it is a, a difficult subject matter? And I mean, I think my, my mom can probably answer this for herself, but my experience was that, yeah, it, it was difficult for my parents in the beginning, and uh, she writes about this in the book very well. Um, you know, there's this great moment where, or maybe not so great, but I receive a letter from my birth father, and my adoptive father comes home that day and says, what did you do today? And I said, oh, I got a letter from my dad. And he's just like, I thought I was your dad. You know, he didn't say that, but that is what he was feeling at the time. And I think one of the things that I was, that I did, perhaps unconsciously, was I never made this divide between the two families. and I worked very hard over the years to make sure that neither one was felt like they received more attention or less attention, and to include both sets of family in each other's lives. And I, you know, I, I think I sort of did that unconsciously, but the end result was that you know, I, I think they never really felt uh, left out or excluded. I just say yes. All right, I'm finding out more now that the book is sort of out in the larger world that it, it is, has made a dif even the book has made a difference to some people. I didn't give this, the st st latest statistics that I have from Pro Buscado is that total of 881 cases have been brought to their attention, specifically of children who were forcibly separated from their families. Nelson's being a fairly unusual, and most of these were in El Salvador, and the largest number remained in El Salvador, although some were adopted out of country. Okay. Of those, they've established the fact that 518 were disappeared. They have had over 200 reunions. 48 have been found but are deceased. But there are almost 100 who were found but there have been no reunion. And that has mostly to do with this fear factor where um, Adoptive families, in particular in Europe, I gather, have sometimes just said, "No way, no, you know, not, not it. we don't want to have a reunion. We don't want to have a coming together." Um, and so that's about 10 percent of those that have actually been identified where there hasn't been any reunion. So I hope that um, one's example. I mean, our lives have been so enriched despite the challenges by being open to this. And uh, I mean, to me, it was sort of obvious that Nelson deserved to, to know this. But it was a shock. <laughs> I mean, we didn't know he was Salvadoran, so you know, it was a real shock.
you know, I mean, this has certainly also been the case in El Salvador, where um, some of the children who were taken, particularly from these areas in the north along the Honduran border, either in Morazan or in Chalatenango, um, who were then adopted by families in the oligarchy, all right? And they grew up not knowing that their birth families were, you know, illiterate peasants, as it were. And at the moment that that this comes to the fore and they find out that they're rejecting, uh, not all, but in some cases, it has, you know, there hasn't been reunion. It's been a very difficult thing within the country where you're raised by, and of course this story about the Guatemalan young man is absolutely incredible because the person who, in a sense, adopted him was the very person who was the second in command of the of the battalion and went in there and massacred the and, you know, threw the babies in the well, and it's just unbelievable. And yet, he preserves a positive view of this man, who then died shortly thereafter, and he was raised by the grandmother. I must say, there are a lot of very heroic grandmothers in many of these stories, in Argentina and in El Salvador, and certainly in our story. Without the grandmother, without the maternal grandmother, I don't think this would have happened. Without Dr. Kirchner, it wouldn't have happened. But, you know, it takes it does take individuals who, you know, care enough to do, to do that searching, to do that investigation, to not give up. You know. I've read and always been interested in the view of the survivors of the Holocaust and what they felt and still feel toward the Nazis. And I'd like to address this question to both of you in terms of what is your feeling now about those who committed such atrocities. I'd be very interested in your response. I, I, again, I, I think this goes maybe back to what I was saying, where in, in some circumstances, I don't feel victimized. You know, It's hard for me to feel anger for, for the soldiers that, that took me or for the people that separated me from my family, because in many ways you could argue that I ended up in a, in a better situation, you know, and, and not, not in terms of um, love or any of that kind of better situation, but in the situation where I get to sort of carry on the work that my parents started. And I don't know, I don't think that I would be here in front of all of you today without that. And so it is this sort of paradox, this just, juxtaposition of, of Things. So it's very hard for me to feel anger for things that I don't remember and people I don't know. Um, I concern myself quite a bit as a professor of German um, with the Holocaust. And my earliest research was in political drama. And, um, and I also talked with many, many people who are of the gener generation who came to the United States, made it here. Um, and one of the things that for me was, well, I think I, I say it in the book, it's almost a miracle within the, within the dark things, are when people can genuinely move beyond. And I see that particularly with the younger generation. I, I see that with the younger generation in Germany and with younger people. Now, there's a very interesting influx of, of people coming from Israel to live in Berlin. And, you know, it's this. Nelson's sister, Ava, said so beautifully that she, she wasn't raised to learn to hate. She just, you know, that there was, that there was this sort of desire to move beyond when you get to the next generation. I, mean, I think it's very difficult, but I, 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 do, I do feel that our story is a hopeful one, that it, it holds out the hope that, that I think we need to know about the atrocities, I think we need to study and understand and question and investigate, but I do think it's possible to see moving beyond. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. So I think we have time for one more. Please and I too. Um, one, one is the question um, about the community in El Salvador and other Central American countries that have had this happen to them and what they view Americans who have 
adopted these children, is there hostility, is there suspicion, is there, what about other people then, your birth family, their friends and so on, and how they're able to relate to North Americans and Europeans obviously as well, but particularly North Americans for having been the engine of so much destruction. And I, let me do my second question, so you can think about that. Um, I adopted a, a girl from, my daughter from El Salvador, voluntarily, her mother gave her up voluntarily, in fact I met her with her mother. Um, and I wonder if you have met other families that were through voluntary adoptions and how different their situation, stories, and experience has been. Um, so I'd like to answer the, the first question first. Um, this was actually something that um, hopefully we'll, we'll make it into the film a little bit later and was uh, kind of a very interesting moment for, for myself when I was visiting El Salvador in uh, December before we did the presidential trip. I was talking to my, uh, one of my uncles um, who it turns out was tortured in, in the revolution and you know, barely, made his, um, barely made it out alive and was also one of the key people to help my mother escape. And I sort of asked him that very question, what do you feel about the Americans in this thing? And he had probably one of the most amazing answers I, I've heard. And he said, you know, for us, it was not a war against the people of America. They are our brothers and sisters. But it was a war against the imperialists who thought that they could do whatever they wanted across you know, different nations. So I think I have found that that is a sentiment that, that sort of rings true with many different people, is that it wasn't you know, the, the general, it was, there's no hostility generally to the American people, but those, they sort of realized that it was a small group of people that were primarily responsible for this, and that is who they see as the, the aggressor. I worried about this when we um, first were going to have the reunion and we knew that relatives from El Salvador were going to come into Costa Rica. And, you know, there was a convergence. Members of the family came by bus two days from El Salvador, uh, aunts and cousins and so forth, and, and people were coming from Panama. And, but they all had lived through this period. And in the very first letter, after the DNA testing, the very first letter that we wrote to members of the family, I tried to make it clear that, that we understood something. I understand a lot more now, but at least even at that time, we understood what a sorry role our government had played in this conflict. To just sort of ease a little bit, I, I worried that they would find it hard to accept us. But at least in Nelson's family, there was no, no hint of that at all. Just this overwhelming sense of gratitude that he was alive, had been well taken care of, was being well educated. Um, yeah, it was really, and I try to put a lot of that in the book so people really see where, these, where they were coming from and how they treated us. I, I, I think it's just fabulous, just marvelous. But as the book goes on, I say, we as North Americans need to understand better what we were up to and what we were supporting there. And I had to have a lot of self-reflection about what did I know at the time? How much did I understand? What was I reading? Not nearly enough. I was definitely Eurocentric. I, mean, I was in, and I knew a lot about Germany and East Germany. And I traveled and did research there, but I didn't know as much as I might have. That was what was happening in El Salvador. So that's the first question. And now I've almost forgotten the second question. Well, I, I, the think second question? Pushing, I think we're pushing our time. Okay, okay. that's so good. That's what I'm saying. During the reception, yeah. come, um, come with your questions individually. Yeah. That's fine. So I, I just wanted to, to thank the University of Chicago for having us. It's been a great uh, trip. And uh, thank all of you for attending. And if you would like to get in touch with us, we would love to hear from you, feedback about the, the book, the, um, the movie, etc. Our websites are missingneela.com uh, and identifyingnelson.com. And so uh, we have both have Facebook groups and emails, and we would really 
love to hear from you.